Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. I want to thank you for listening. I want to ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate right now to the show notes for this episode, where you'll find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find our show. This week, I'm joined by Noah Gould, Acton's alumni and student programs manager, and Emily Zanotti, contributing editor here at Acton. This week, we'll be discussing how young is too young to retire, and President Biden's opposition to the sale of U.S. steel to a Japanese steel company. But first, I'm going to go very online, and we're going to talk about TikTok. There is legislation that has moved through the House of Representatives that has passed that would, in effect, ban TikTok. What the bill does is it demands, it gives a six uh, week or six month period of time that requires ByteDance, the parent company that owns TikTok, that is a Chinese company, to divest of TikTok, sell it off. And if they don't in that period of time or after that six months elapses, then the app is going to effectively be banned in the United States. One can make the argument that that is the intended outcome of this legislation. Six months, A, is a relatively short period of time to execute a sale of the third largest social media platform in the world. There's also complicating factors having to do with the financial aspect of it. When everyone knows that ByteDance is going to have to sell it to continue operating in the United States, it's going to drive the price down because they are either going to be banned in the country or they're going to have to sell it off to someone. That's going to put downward pressure on the price. There's also a uh, law in China that prohibits the sale of the algorithm, which really is what you would want TikTok for, not just the user base, but for the algorithm that they have. So if you're an American company looking to acquire it, yes, you can acquire essentially the app and its user base, but you're losing the algorithm that it's that's its special sauce. So the question of how valuable it actually will be to you is now in question even more, putting probably even more downward pe- pressure on the price of that. The reasons for this, there are a number of them. Uh, One of them has to do with national security concerns. People who have reverse engineered TikTok have revealed that there's a lot of data that is going back to ByteDance, uh, which the Chinese Communist Party in some way, shape or form does control because that's the nature of the Chinese economy. So there's a lot of data going back there. There's a reason that it is banned from being on the phones of people who work for the federal government, who work for a lot of state governments because they don't want that information being sent back. So there's the data mining aspect of this, the national security aspect of this. There are also people who are concerned over the effect that TikTok is having, particularly on younger people. A lot of the complaints about the algorithm is that it will push things to the fore and push down other things that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't like. You can find things on there about, say, Tiananmen Square, uh, what's going on with the Uyghurs, but it's not the kind of stuff that's going to show up in your algorithmic feed nearly as much. Here's where I should also mention that we do have an Acton Institute TikTok account and we did get banned for sharing content promoting our documentary film, The Hong Konger, Jimmy Lai's Extraordinary Struggle for Freedom. It is the Chinese Communist Party who is persecuting Jimmy Lai in Hong Kong. You can draw your own conclusions as to why they may or may not have wanted that content to be promoted to the extent that we were promoting it. So... There's, a lot, again, a lot of interesting aspects about this. There's questions about the nature of this legislation, about executive power, about free speech, and about the kind of weird bipartisan nature of this, that in a Congress in Washington, D.C., where not a lot of people agree on a lot of things, this actually has moved pretty quickly. Uh, the cascade of opinion on it has been kind of fascinating to watch. So, Noah, I'll go to you first. Is... Is this legislation, is the effort to force the sale and divestiture of TikTok, um, have it owned by an American company, and if not that, then to ban it 
a good thing? Yeah, so I find the, uh, the, the two arguments that are being used, right? There's the kind of children's health aspect, which I think is very real, but that comes down to a kind of caveat emptor, you know, just don't let your kids use TikTok kind of thing. Doesn't come to the kind of level of having Congress ban it. And if a sale happened and they were able to recreate some sort of algorithm, that problem wouldn't go away from this uh, this bill. Now, I think the national security uh, kind of issues and questions are real, and th- the interesting bipartisan nature of this, I think, is compelling as far as people realizing, hey, we're giving a lot of power to potentially a centralized government that is on a lot of U.S. devices with a lot of data. So I find that pretty convincing. Yeah, there's... <laughs> I think one could potentially be in favor of the general thrust of this legislation while simultaneously having reservations about the way that it has come to take shape in that you are once again seeing an example of Congress investing a whole lot of power that they should be retaining into the executive branch to have the president of the United States determine what apps or what websites are owned by what foreign adversaries, which countries really count as foreign adversaries. Adversaries. Um, that's a lot of power, again, to put into the president of the United States. On one level, you could make the argument, I guess, that we've already invested so much power in the chief executive. What's the harm in having the chief executive handle this as well? But I think for those of us who are wary of the over-investiture of power into a single individual who runs one branch of the federal government – is perhaps not that great of an idea. Emily, since I know you've got uh, a a legal background, I was hoping that you could address some of the uh, arguments based around free speech concerns, First Amendment concerns that hang around this legislation. I mean, always when it comes down to it, uh, if you're going to see a bill that passes in such a... a uniquely bipartisan way where like maybe six people vote against it. I think that's probably an indicator that either this doesn't do much or this is sort of a Trojan horse type of bill. Um, And there are free speech concerns, especially given that you have a freedom of association here. You have a freedom to conduct your business as you'd like. You have a freedom to contract with whomever you'd like. Um, This is the government coming in and saying, well, you know, you can't, have China involved in an app production? Well, I mean, pretty much every app is involved (laughs) with China in some way. Your data, um, your Apple phone is made by Uyghurs in, um, and and so it's just an odd, it's an odd decision. Now, of course, the government isn't saying you can't speak a certain way or say a certain thing, um and it's it's a promise to you know to sort of get involved in what a platform can put on and can't and what it has to allow and doesn't um which is an overarching concerns about social media just in general like at what point does the government get to dictate what is on a social media platform and where does that start to run into the first amendment and the answer is probably bigger than just TikTok. And that's why this bill is concerning people like Elon Musk. It's concerning probably Facebook to some extent, although their Instagram platform is a competitor for TikTok. So they're certainly not opposed to this particular bill. But there is some indications that this is government trying to get involved in what a platform can and cannot do. And that has concerning implications down the line, especially for someone that the government currently doesn't like, like Elon Musk. Yeah. The one of the other arguments that I've heard about this is that you we do not allow foreign entities to own television stations, to own radio stations, to own uh, newspapers within the United States. There's a long history of that. Rupert Murdoch had to become an American citizen in order to maintain his ownership of Fox. 
Um, so there is, again, a history to all of this. But what I find interesting in this conversation is it returns us to a previous social media conversation that we've been having for the last couple of years, which is what are these things? You know, if it's clear to me that a television station, that a newspaper, um, that a radio station is a publisher. You know, they are the ones choosing and curating the content that is going on to their station, that is going out over the airwaves, that is going into a newspaper. Um, we've had and a lot. Those, and those things use federally controlled mediums to get to people. So a newspaper likely uses the United States Postal Service. Um, television stations likely use cable lines, which we see as a commodity. Um, the government already regulates what can be delivered to your house. It already regulates what can be on your TV. But then you have the phone. And yep. that is an entirely different medium. Like, does the government now, because it regulates Wi-Fi, then become responsible for regulating what you can get? And then how closely do we then get to somewhere like China that says you can't have X, Y, and Z? You have to have a closed... Uh, a closed network. So in China, there is a a clone of every single thing that we understand in the United States. There's a Facebook clone. There's a Twitter clone. There's a Reddit clone. Um, and they create and monitor all of that. Uh, so it becomes a question of, does the government, just by virtue of kind of regulating your phone, now become a the ability to regulate the apps that you put on your phone too. Yeah, that 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 is a good point, and uh, I will admit that the you know, I couldn't have produced a documentary like I did without having a you know pretty significant level of paranoia about the Chinese Communist Party and what China is trying to do. Um, however, I you know I, I take in in good faith the people who make the point that like all the kinds of data that they are acquiring from people is the kind of data that is purchasable out there on an open market. So, you know, it's it, I, I guess I I struggle more with the the wisdom of this from a national security perspective and from. Uh, even though I think I may be a little bit persuaded on the national security perspective front, I don't know that this is like the best or right way to go about dealing with this problem. I don't think for me personally, the First Amendment arguments, you know, you can, if you're a creator, uh, one, you know, I, I made this point on a radio program last night, that uh, if, if you're not working to own your audience, to own it outside of whatever platform it is that you're building an audience on, then you're making an enormous mistake. I've, I've just seen over too many years as a digital marketer, people who have built up these Facebook pages that were based on, you know, images with text and quotes on them, and then Facebook changes the algorithm them to deprioritize images that have a lot of text on them. And the whole thing that you've built up is just gone overnight. And if you're not working to own that audience on your own, then you're making a huge mistake. You can, as a creator, take what you're doing to other platforms if TikTok were to disappear. Um, so I, I guess where I personally find myself, and, and no, I'm kind of curious where, where maybe you're thinking about this, um, I'm instinctually opposed to banning things like this, and I'm open to hearing the arguments. I just I don't think that I've been persuaded that this is necessitated. Now, Instagram and TikTok are ultimately almost mirror images of each other. So right. Instagram's reels and TikTok both generally have the same content. The same creators are on both sites. Um, the difference between Instagram. Okay. The difference between Instagram and TikTok are is the algorithm. So Instagram Reels is going to serve you certain materials. Like if I go on there, it's mostly gardens and chickens and millennial mom content. If I go on TikTok, it's more invasive. You can tell as an app that it's more invasive into other apps on your phone or into your location data. In knowing um, what you're interested in. In knowing what you're interested in. It is a much better algorithm yeah. um, in the sense that if I'm visiting Goodwill three times a week, it will serve me content of other people thrifting and going to Goodwill because it's got my location data. Um, so it's, it is a different, you can tell just by using Instagram reels as opposed to TikTok, 
that it is collecting more and better data on you um, and creating a social profile of you. Um, and we know that China is very big on social profiles and social credit. So there is certainly an element that is a little bit scary about what actually your profile as a TikTok user looks like to ByteDance and then to the Chinese government. So that is actually where I do sort of get concerned about it. Um, and I think that that can be manipulated in ways that are dangerous generally, especially with kids. I think you see a lot of this gender dysphoria thing um, kind of originated with TikTok and it, it blew up very quickly. Now it's sort of on the, as, as, as my uh, neighbor children tell me, it's on the, on the waning side of the trend. But this is built up and driven by places like TikTok that are using this user data. So I think the question becomes, if you're just collecting user data to sell you things like Old Navy ads on Instagram, that's one thing. But if you're collecting social profiles on people that are then going to be used almost like a weaponized version of an app, then that might be very different. Yeah. yeah Sorry, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's great. I think the way to, to that I've seen the algorithm visualized and the way it serves you content if, is picture the roots of a tree branching out, and it's going to get you into each sub branch and then to another sub branch and to another sub branch until it kind of knows exactly what uh, you like. And one of the reasons it was a better is a better algorithm than like YouTube or or Instagram is these super short videos. They can tell how long you you spend on a video instead of what you would learn about one person from an hour long video. In the same amount of time, you can serve someone two hundred super short videos and learn. 200 times the amount of information about that person. So, yeah, I think it's this combination of our kind of fears about what is this doing to kids? What is this doing to their brains? Which I think is very valid. Now, whether the government or individual parents are the best action steps for that. Right. But I think in the congressional sense, that fear is combining with the national security fears to kind of make this the issue and are there other issues that are probably more pressing when we think about china and national security yes but is this a real one I, yeah i think there's still some debate and and kind of discussion we need but this is part of the the problem in the conversation i think you make a great point uh, there in that you this is kind of you know, why tiktok it is a bit of an overdetermined phenomenon because you have the same concerns, perhaps even more pronounced with TikTok, with um, the algorithm, with the amount of data being collected, with the impact that it is having on younger people. Emily mentioned the gender dysphoria stuff, um, the way that uh, particularly uh, what I would argue is very propagandistic content having to do with Israel in Gaza, uh, particularly uh, against Israel and in favor of the uh, Palestinian cause is being elevated and pro-Israel content is being uh, diminished. It It is overdetermined in that because you have the China and the national security concerns to add to it, we're kind of taking out our frustration about social media and its impact on young people on this one particular app without really thinking yeah. about the bigger consequences or the parental role in all of this. So, you know, I've, I've, uh, you know, as we see Emily's, uh, uh, one of Emily's children uh, joining the podcast, <laughs> um, you know, neither of you both have, you both have children, but not quite at the age where you have to worry about one of them having a phone. I've got a 13 year old who, you know, we did get her a phone. The things that she has on it are pretty limited. I have kept her off social media in a way you can accuse me of being like a Steve Jobsian kind of hypocrite in that he invented a device like an iPad and then didn't let what wouldn't let his children use it. Um, you, you know, feel free to hurl those accusations at me, but I, I consider it to be more of a parental responsibility and not a governmental responsibility to determine and what kinds of things that my children should access. And I've just never liked the abdication of parental responsibility to somebody else, particularly the state, to save our kids from our own bad parenting. Just don't know what the state can do about it. Yeah. I mean, quite honestly, I don't understand. We, we always jump to 
government power to do something about this you know like who's gonna take care of this disaster that is tiktok that it's serving this content um and i do want to point out that i just put this product into my amazon cart and i just got a tiktok for it so like i it is clearly reading other apps um I like literally opened up TikTok and that was the first thing. And I put that into my Amazon cart like an hour beforehand. Um, But like, what is the government going to do? I I just, it's not going to go and sit on TikTok all day and make sure the algorithm is promoting this and promoting that. And, and there's a vested interest politically for say, you know, more progressive people to be more open about gender dysphoria. So they're not going to control it as much. And then a conservative gets in and perhaps they have a different set of priorities. And then we're turning over priorities to the government. I, it, it's just sort of like a, be a parent and watch your kids and watch what they consume. Um, And even if they don't have a phone, our neighbor is an eight-year-old, nine-year-old. She doesn't have a phone, and yet she's consuming a lot of content that is not necessarily something that maybe I would let my kids consume, but her parents don't let her have a phone. So they will find some other way of getting this content. So you kind of have to be vigilant. I mean, there's just a long history of young people accessing things that parents tell them that they shouldn't have or shouldn't access to the extent that it turns like, you know, banned in Boston um, into essentially great marketing. If you could get your book banned in Boston, it was going to turn probably into a bestseller. So it's, it's not as if there isn't a long history of young people finding ways around the things that their parents tell them that they shouldn't access. And accessing the straight them. sand effect works across media. Yeah, we talk about the straight sand effects on digital media, and that means you know, with Barbara Streisand says you should not put this photo of her on the internet. Of course, it explodes, yep. and everyone sees that Barbara Streisand photo. It works in all forms of media, whether it's television, whether it's me- movies, to the point where it is a marketing strategy to say that this is banned in an X or banned in Y. Um, or your parents don't want you to see this. Like, you know, that content is always there and you're always going to struggle with that as a parent. And I'm not going to abrogate my duty to Joe Biden because, you know, China happens to make an app. Yeah, one one last note on this, which is I, I would say, and I don't think this is an issue for federal legislation. Perhaps it's something that I would be more in favor of on a state level, but um, rather than you know, banning certain apps or regulating what can be on people's phones, uh, I, I would be more in favor of just uh, particularly in public schools, since states control public schools, um, just mandating that phones need to be put away, sealed up. My kid's school has this similar policy because your seventh and eighth graders are going to start having phones. They put them in a plastic bag at the beginning of the day and they put them away. And they're not allowed to take them out. I think getting them out of schools is something I'm far more concerned about than I am about these specific apps that are on them. I want to move on now to our next topic, Uh, and and because we're a little short on time today, might be our last topic. We'll see if we get to the Japan and U.S. Seal story, but I do want to spend some time on this. You, uh, if you're listening to this, may very well be familiar with one Ben Shapiro, uh, he of the Ben Shapiro Show and the Daily Wire. There was a video from his program going around last week where he was discussing the ideas of work, retirement, the retirement age, or at least the governmental retirement age being at 65 years old. Uh, it's a couple minutes of that that got clipped, so we're gonna, we'll drop that in here so you can all hear it. It's insane that we haven't raised the retirement age in the United States. It's totally crazy. Joe Biden, if that were the case, Joe Biden should not be running for president. Hey, Joe Biden is 81 years old. The retirement age in the United States at which you start to receive Social Security and you are eligible for Medicare, is 65. Joe Biden has technically been eligible for Social Security and Medicare for 16 years, and he wants to continue in office until he is 86, which is 19 years, past when he would be eligible for retirement. No one in the United States should be retiring at 65 years old. Frankly, I think retirement itself is a stupid idea unless you have some sort of health problem. Everybody that I know who who is elderly, who has retired, is dead within five years. And if you talk to people who are elderly and they lose their purpose in life by losing their job and they stop working, things go to hell in a handbasket real quick. But put all of that aside, just on a fiscal level and on a logical level, 
When Franklin Delano Roosevelt established 65 as the retirement age, the average life expectancy in the United States was 63 years old. Today, the average life expectancy in the United States is close to 80. It's totally insane that you believe that you should be able to work from the time that you are essentially 20 to the time that you are 65, which is a 45 year period, pay in, and then you will receive social security benefits sufficient to support you and your family, you and your wife or whatever, for like another 20 years. That's crazy talk. That is not fiscally sustainable. The notion that if you have to raise the retirement age to 67 or 68, that everyone is going to fall apart. My parents are that age. My parents are not retired. And they shouldn't retire. It would be very bad for them to retire. By the way, it's disrespectful to people who are 67, 68, 69 years old to suggest that they are in the same shape as people who are 65 were in 1940. It's not true at all. Have you met a 65-year-old lately? 65-year-olds are not old in the United States. They're not. 68-year-olds are not old in the United States. Again, Joe Biden thinks he's not old, and that dude is running for president again, and that dude actually is old, and he's 81. I, I failed to see how a country in which our entire leadership class is 80 plus is telling you that we should have a retirement age of 65. It makes no sense at all. Okay, so Emily, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you, um, and I'm also gonna put in the show notes the conversation that I recently had with uh, David Bonson about his book Full Time, which addresses a lot of these issues about the way we think about work, the relationship that we have with work, um, the kind of way, particularly the church has communicated work, um, and he's speaking from a more um, uh, Protestant evangelical perspective, uh, considers it to be kind of like a necessary evil, uh, a thing we kind of have to do, uh, and he makes an argument that it is kind of what we were created for um, and to it wants to change the way that we think about it in our relationship with it. Um, Emily, what did, what did you make of uh, Ben Shapiro's comments here? So I think he's sort of conflating two different things. And one is the mandatory retirement age, at which point you start receiving Social Security, which um, at its infancy was designed as something you paid into and then you got the money back that you paid into it and over time has sort of become an entitlement program in the sense that the government rated Social Security and then now taxpayers have to fund Social Security and it may no longer be there. Um And then the other aspect of it, which is that work should continue until you can no longer work physically and not until you no longer want to work mentally. And so from my perspective, I think the first one is more difficult to deal with just because, you know, it's really people have paid into Social Security. And if you didn't want that to happen, we should have thought about that maybe 20 or 30 years ago. We were very into Social Security entitlement reform spending like in the Bush era, and we're kind of resurrecting it now for some reason. Um, perhaps because we have two 80-year-olds running for president and it all seems like this is a boomer world. Um, but the next part is, do you work to live or do you live to work? And quite honestly, I think in work is a paycheck. Um, you can also have a vocation from a Catholic perspective and that determines your life's purpose. But a job, a menial job, does not have to continue for the rest of your life. I think we as a society now think of work as the only option and the only thing that makes us interesting and the only thing we do with our lives. And because of the digital age, we work in a 24-7 environment. Um, and, you know, fair warning, or, you know, I should mention that at one point I did work for the Daily Wire. Um, and so it, it we always think of work as the top priority. And that seems to be what he's going for here. Like work is your purpose. Um, but truly life is your purpose and family is your purpose and your vocation is your purpose. Uh, so I, I think it's kind of a little twisted. Uh, I get what he's saying about social security. I, I don't quite ascribe to the idea that you must work all the time until you die. <laughs> 
Yeah, the uh, we we should note for perspective that um, the retirement age, uh, as dictated by Social Security, so the age at which you were eligible to receive Social Security benefits, was from its instantiation until 1983 was 65. In 1983, it becomes 67. Uh, the argument that people would make, and I think is a very compelling argument about the problems with Social Security, is the change in life expectancy over that time is a huge reason that we have a problem with that entitlement program right now. In uh, the New Deal era, when this was created, uh, while 65 was the retirement age, 60 was the average lifespan. So you had to live five years beyond the average lifespan of the average life expectancy in order to begin collecting it. Well, as the life expectancy, as the average age at which people pass has gotten older and older and older, we have not indexed that age to keep up with it. So there wasn't you know, a way of keeping it a couple of years beyond the average life expectancy to keep the program cabin to what it was originally trying to do. And now it essentially has become you know, an entitlement, a benefit, uh, something that people begin to get at 67 years old and collect for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years sometimes. And it is something that has grown beyond the realm in which we can afford it. So yes, as Emily points out, there is that aspect of it, but there's also the what is our relationship with work and our lives, which is kind of more the David Bonson point, and I would refer people to that conversation to, to check his perspective out on that. Yeah, there's a bunch of different threads here that we could uh, go into I've always find, found the idea of retirement kind of puzzling, kind of this strange, empty dream of idleness. Uh, you know, at so, some point we'll get to stop working and then travel or golf or something like that. And I don't find that compelling. So because we're made to kind of solve problems, we're made to be active. And so I don't think it has to be a job with a paycheck. And so if that's what... Uh, Shapiro means that I think, yeah, it is off to say you have to work until you're like physically no longer able. But just doing nothing is not very conducive mentally or physically to thriving as people age. So I think a lot of people are thinking through, okay, even if I am able to retire from my job and then be, you know, self-sustaining, um, I need to have something that replaces that. So maybe that's um, kind of an avocation that you've worked on during your career and are going to continue more on a volunteer basis. Maybe that's, you know, being more active with your grandkids. But this idea of retirement as idleness or inactivity isn't compelling kind of on a society level as a goal for what we want. And that's kind of what we've built a lot of the workforce around is if you work really hard now, you can retire. And so I think we need a broader view of what work is in the kind of Martin Luther sense when he talks about um, vocation and Christian calling. He blows up the idea of the kind of priests have a vocation and then everyone else is just a little bit less spiritual. And he's trying to bring it into a much more um, kind of, priest of all, priesthood of all believers, as in each person has a purpose and your work is a part of that purpose. And so he elevates the kind of everyday work that that we all do. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, <laughs> then when you add the kind of more Kyperian sense of uh, work and ev kind of every square inch is under God as Christians, that elevates work to another level. I don't know if that's what Ben Shapiro is talking about uh, here, but that is something to think about as we think about our work having meaning that can maybe change the way we think about retirement. So it doesn't have to be a paycheck, but we need some sort of purpose and work to do after we retire. Yeah, I, my, my friend... And too, like, there's some privilege to that, right? So if you're in a white-collar job, if you have the ability to go out every single day and do something that you love and make money at it. And I, I think a lot of people felt like Ben Shapiro was kind of living his dream. And so he was able to say, well, you don't need to retire at 65 or 70. You should keep going forever. Um, a lot of people were like, yes, but I work a blue collar job. And so I had the opportunity to retire and stop doing something for a paycheck and start doing something I want. And so retirement is itself something that we don't really define correctly, right? So we think of retirement maybe the way that my 
great grandparents who, well, they would lived on a farm and herded goats until they died. That's very different. But the American sort of union worker definition of retirement at 65 and pulling a pension, um, that was something that was previous. Whereas, you know, now, I don't know, my parents are over retirement age and they're not really retired. Like, they don't think yeah. retirement is the same thing. <laughs> yeah, my, um, my, my friend Mike Cosper at Christianity Today made a point about the, the Ben Shapiro commentary that's like, you know, spoken by like somebody who doesn't do physical labor. You know, the idea that if you have a job where, you know, the skill set that you're bringing to it is is physical industriousness, a strong back. Um, there's a there's a lifespan to that uh, in which you're only going to be able to do that into a certain point of older age, um, and then you need to retire at least from that kind of physical labor. I think I think it's a very good point, and perhaps this is why you know uh, Ben Shapiro should have been a little bit more clear in what he was talking about. Uh, so that's a for, you know for him working as a communicator failure on his own work product there and that he wasn't clear enough in what he was talking about. But um, you you have, I I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, not just the social security is a perfect example for the kind of program that gets put on autopilot and gets out of hand very quickly. I mean, that's definitely a truism. I mean, go back to the point I was making before that people would only start collecting benefits five years past the average lifespan of the time. Well, once the average lifespan gets much longer, people start collecting benefits earlier and earlier, and it turns into a different kind of program than what it was when it was initially created, which, you know, to Emily's point about Trade union workers and people who do that kind of physical labor, pipe fitters, manufacturing. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of, uh, I'm, in fact, I'm completely opposed to the idea of public sector unions, but don't really have a big problem with private sector unions. Um, because, one, there's actually some give and take between management and labor at companies like that. And the ability to structure something like a pension program, knowing well av- on average how long people are going to be able to be a pipe fitter or an electrical engineer and to be able to do that kind of physical labor work, they can structure their own retirement plan in a way that provides for those people because they have local knowledge of those people or even people in similar circumstances in different areas of the country, if it's a national union, which in most cases, um, organizations like that are. I- I'm not particularly bothered by that, um, but it-, it is something, what I'm bothered by is the way people, some people were reading into what Shapiro was saying, which I- I'm gonna be a little bit generous to him and say he's not, which is that like, it is necessary that you work yourself into a grave. I, I just don't think that's what he's trying to say. Um, now, he didn't say say it clear enough, and I I will fault him for that. But to make the point that I think Noah has been making and Emily has been making, that it's the it's the continue of engagement of some kind of industriousness of self beyond the point at which you're working just to collect a paycheck in order to provide for your family. This gets into what David Bonson talks about in his book of getting beyond seeing work as this necessary evil, this thing that we have to do in order to sustain ourselves, to provide for our family. And, you know, not everybody is as blessed. You know, I get to do like what I'm doing right now and talk into a microphone um, for a living. Uh, it's, you know, it's the kind of thing that it doesn't, you know, take a lot of physical labor on my part. It's the kind of thing I could, as long as my mind stays sound, continue doing for a very long period of time. I recognize that a lot of people have different work experiences, but trying to figure out that what are you going to do as a person to be mentally engaged, somewhat physically engaged, industrious, beyond some arbitrary age that we've decided is the retirement age, I think is the real question we should be trying to answer. Yeah, and I think the problem with the phrasing here is that uh, when we phrase it around uh, kind of the, the social security question, that kind of muddies the water of this retirement purpose, what are you going to do yes, after yes, yes. your job question, which is two different things. And so I think it's unhelpful to phrase it as like, we need to stop giving money to these people who are just trying to retire. Like that's that's just a bad take. Uh, versus there's going to be different retirement ages if we're thinking about retirement as ending a traditional job that are going to work for different types of occupations. And so I think there's some room for a reform, but that's another conversation from a values conversation 
when what is the value and, and purpose after a traditional job ends and what should we be encouraging people as an ideal to pursue yeah and my my job will never end i'm a writer right so whether i'm doing it at a homestead in nashville with my kids or my kids are growing up and leaving and i'm doing it from a margaritaville planned retirement community in between times <laughs> playing pickleball um it's not really going to change much for me, but I might not write to live. I might write trashy romance novels because that's what I want to do. Or, you know, like those are things that change a little bit in terms of time. But I think, um, and having worked for a lot of conservative organizations, there is always this sort of tension among people who see profit as a good or see money as a good. What then... What is the difference between making a living and making a life? So if you work, um, you know, I won't I won't say specifically what organization, but if you work for an organization that doesn't give maternity leave, that doesn't have a retirement plan, that's sort of like a shoestring health care because they believe that you should structure your life outside of that um, and the businesses businesses focus should be making money. And by having maternity leave, you're taking away from that. Um, I think conservative organizations sometimes struggle with the idea of paying to support somebody doing something else. Um, and, and so that that's overarching. What is what is the value of making a living versus the value of making a life? And do your employees have the right to make a life outside of work? Um, Shapiro talked a lot about how his company sustains several hundred people and perhaps thousands of dependents. But, you know, you can sustain somebody monetarily, but are you sustaining them as a human being? And do businesses have the the requirement to sustain their workers as a human being? That that is that is actually a, a question. Um and retirement is included in that. Do you have the right as a business to cut somebody off at 65? Or should you help them plan for something beyond that? Um, it, it, that's you yeah. know, a societal and cultural question, too. One of the things that frustrates me in, in the whole entire conversation that came up around this is <clears throat> the way that it kind of stops treating people as individuals. Um, that, you know, even for people who do engage in, say, physical labor. So my grandfather... When he moved from the St. Louis area down to St. Petersburg, Florida, started a business down there, Lloyd's Aluminum, which did uh, vinyl siding, windows, and doors. Pretty good business to be in in Florida on the Gulf Coast when you're going to get a hurricane that comes through every couple of years and rips off everybody's siding and doors and windows, and you get to replace it. Um, he did retire at one point in time. He spent the first couple of weeks of that fixing absolutely everything around my grandparents' house that needed to be fixed. And then he started driving my grandmother insane. And she told him, go back to work. Because he needed that kind of outlet. He needed something like that to do. And, you know, he couldn't do the yeah, same amount of... Yeah, my dad did that. Yeah. Like, he retired from construction and, like, he got a job at Home Depot for, like, 30 seconds. And he was just annoying people at Home Depot, telling them how to do things. And then he would go home and annoy my mom. And so she was like, could you just please get another job? And now he has another job. Like, some people just can't retire. <laughs> yeah. So, the, I, like, my point again to, like, the, the private sector union thing of being able to better know the workforce that you're representing or even, as, as Emily was talking about, you know, doesn't sound like the kind of place where I would necessarily like to work. You know, I think particularly conservative organizations, one that advance a viewpoint about the importance of, you know, um, vocation and life and family um, to be pretty generous in providing things like uh, benefits that help encourage things like child rearing when you're younger, um, but also planning for what will come later in life. But letting those kinds of organizations make those decisions, present themselves to potential employees as 
this is what we are. This is our philosophy. This is how we engage in these things. You know, if you want to work for a company that helps you plan a whole lot for your future, there are companies that will do that. If you want to work for a company that doesn't care as much and is willing to pay you more in terms of raw salary rather than put it into benefits programs that have certain kinds of tax advantages, both for you and for the company, you should be free to do that. It is the escalation of the way that we must deal with this up to a uh, kind of a federal this is the same for everybody kind of level, which is the social security part of the conversation. But I think you're uh, you're both right in that it is it is obscuring the bigger conversation, which is about you know how you live the relationship with work and some kind of industriousness, not just for the purpose of bringing home a paycheck that is being lost in this conversation. Mm-hmm. And we should clarify here that. Acton does give maternity leave. That's that's not the anonymous yes, organization. Yes. That, <laughs> we are not talking uh, about the Acton Institute. Benefits very, here are at Acton no, are, 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 are. I know that's not what you were saying. Yeah, I just want yep. to make that no, clear. I, I, we do. Uh, I don't know if I'm technically even an employee. Yeah. Of Acton. I well, and you and, and Emily to this point, right? Like, there's different <laughs> kinds where we're not getting too like you know pulling back the curtain too much. There are different kinds of work relationships. So, like, we work together right. in, a, in yeah. a contractor relationship. I'm a full time employee. Mm-hmm. Noah's a full time employee. These kinds of structures are different. I had a consulting firm for a number of years in which I had contracts with, you know, various other organizations yeah. and put those together. That created my salary. I paid for health care. I paid for, um, you know, towards my retirement and all of that. Um, I, things that empower the individual a lot more than we're currently empowering the individual are the kinds of things that I would be in favor of. And I think is a lot of what's getting lost in this conversation um, and part yeah, and uh, pre- created. Like me- someone like me. I, I I wanted to spend more time with my kids. So I became a, a part-time employee or a, a scale up to full-time employee for a different organization. And then I do editing work so that I can sustain a standard of living. Like it, it I think people should be free to do that. And then you look at places like California where they are restricting people like me who are quote unquote gig workers or, um, you know, go month to month on things like that. And and that's the government getting involved in a bad way. Yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, you should be free to structure your life as you'd like. And um, no, Acton was not the anonymous organization that yeah. I was speaking of. <laughs> um, yeah. But I've worked for everything from, you know, shoestring conservative organizations to Fortune 500 companies. And they are all very different. And if you want a a very solid foundation underneath of you, underneath you. Fortune 500 is the way to go. Um, and places like Daily Wire will tell you when you work there that this is a 24-7 job and you don't get to do these things. So it, it is, it's, you, you have the ability to ask those questions and structure your life for yourself. And I'm not saying it's good or bad either way. You know? We are going to punt on our final topic of the day and we will call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Act and Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look right now in the show notes for a link where you can subscribe directly to Act and Unwind or just search Act and Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, five-star reviews only, so that more people can find this show. Thanks to Noah. Thanks to Emily. For the Acton Institute, I'm Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week. <laughs>